Greetings, my name is Bob McCarthy and I'd like to talk to you a little bit about my book, Sound Systems, Design and Optimization. We're going to focus on Chapter 2, Summation, give you a little bit of information about what's in that chapter. We're going to talk about what happens when you do acoustic addition and subtraction. We're going to combine two sources. A simplistic formula to show you that is 1 plus 1 equals 1, plus or minus 1. That little asterisk means depends on phase. Phase is, of course, the secret agent behind the scenes that decides whether or not when we add two speakers together, whether we get addition or we get subtraction. The way this plays out is that the thing called the phase wheel give us some insight here. What I'm going to show you is that at the top of the phase wheel where you are 360 or 0 degrees apart, 1 plus 1 equals 2, otherwise known as an addition of 6 dB. By the time we reach 38 degrees out of phase between two sources, 1 plus 1 equals 1.9, which means you only get 5.5 dB of addition instead of that full 6. 90 degrees of offset means 1 plus 1 equals 1.4, just 3 dB of addition. At 120 degrees, we reach a break-even point where two speakers delivers the same amount of energy as a single one, 1 plus 1 equals 1. Beyond 120 degrees, we can start to find subtraction. 1 plus 1 is giving us a 6 dB loss, and by the time we reach 180 degrees, commonly known as out of phase, complete cancellation has occurred, and you can get yourself uh, no sound uh, at all at that location. When we move and expand this beyond uh, such an abstraction, we're going to put frequency response into the formula. We have to factor time in. In this case, time offsets between two sources will shift all frequencies by the same amount of time. And yet, these time offsets will shift all frequencies by a different amount of phase. The result of this summation, then, with time offset inputs is response ripple, also known as comb filtering and a variety of other names. Let's see how that looks. We're going to do some complex addition by looking at the amplitude and phase response of source A and source B, which in this case are identical. Two identical sources with perfectly matched amplitude and phase will give 6 dB of addition in the amplitude and no change in the phase. By contrast, when we have something with flat amplitude added to another item with flat amplitude, but with differing phase, in this case the phase is different because they're one millisecond apart from each other, the phase shift is turning, and we find ourselves turned to 360 degrees of phase shift, or one wavelength, one cycle, at 1 kilohertz, two cycles at 2 kilohertz, and on and on. Every 1 kilohertz, we find that the phase wheel that we saw earlier has turned a complete circle. This results in response ripple, which causes first addition, then cancellation, then addition again, then cancellation again, every 1 kilohertz with additions at 1K, 2K, 3K, 4K, and on you go, and with cancellations at 500, 1500, and on you go like that. This is what occurs when you have two things with matched amplitude. But not everything always has matched amplitude at all frequencies. In this case, flat amplitude is being matched with something with a downward slope in the amplitude, a filtered response. It still has one millisecond of offset, and what you see is a dampened amount of peaks and dips. The peaks aren't as high, and the dips aren't as deep as they were when the signals were at the same level. So what we have is a reduced effect when, this, when there's some isolation in the amplitude response between the sources. This plays out spatially in our world, and we can start to see how that's going to play out by looking at the tendencies of level isolation, level offset, on this on the x-axis, and time offset in the y-axis, which will gil, gil, build for us a family of um, responses. We can maintain a flat response as long as we don't allow any time offset between the two systems. That goes along this line, and I'm working myself from 0 dB plus 0 dB to 0 dB plus something that's reduced, and what we find is we get 6 dB of addition here and slowly moving our way to less than 6 dB uh, to a trivial amount by the time we've got 12 dB of isolation between the sources. 
moving up this way with zero dB of isolation, we find ourselves getting more and more time offset. So the combing starts off in the highs with the tenth of a millisecond, moves into the mid-range when you've got one millisecond of offset, and down even full range all the way down to the lows with ten millisecond of offset between them. The diagonal path here is the path of heading towards isolation while starting to accumulate some amount of offset. And this is the practical world where we find ourselves with multiple sources that can't physically be put in the same place, so they've got some time offset between them. We're able to isolate the highs, not able to isolate the lows, so we're expecting interaction in the lows, but we can find ourselves isolated in the highs. Let's take an example two-speaker array. In this case, I've got two 90-degree speakers, of which I've got placed exactly straight ahead so that, that uh, they have a meeting point in the center. You can see that meeting point where we have a perfectly flat response because there's no level offset and no time offset. As we move off of the center, what we find is that we've got um, an imperfect time situation, but we don't have any level isolation. Therefore, we start to see combing start to happen in the high frequencies. As we move further off to the side, we'll find the combing will start to move down into the lower frequencies. Why? Because the time offset gets larger as we move off axis uh, here, because we get a larger displacement between the two sources. Let's look now at the 10 kilohertz response as it's spatially mapped over the space. You can see at the center is that coupling zone spot that I talked about, that spot of perfect addition, which I like to call the bingo free spot. By contrast, as we move off the center, you're going 180 degrees, then to 360. This is the spinning of the phase wheel, and it's spinning again and again and again and again. Because every time we move a tenth of a millisecond apart between these sources, we spin the phase wheel again. By this time, we've spun, we've moved 10 turns of the wheel. Well, that's going to be enough to get us one turn of the wheel at 1 kilohertz, because 1 kilohertz is 10 times as large a wavelength. So you see we've turned one time, and there we are. But none of that's large enough to turn the wheel at 100 hertz, which is 10 times larger again. And so you see a nice unified response at 100 hertz. By contrast, we're going to take two speakers and we're going to splay them apart. And here we have a pair of 90 degree speakers pushed at 90 degrees of isolation between them, called the splay angle. What you see now is we have a response that looks like its speaker is off axis because the two speakers are off axis. Their off axis edges are meeting in the center. And then we start to find ourselves where we've got some combing between them as we move off center. But then we move towards isolation. Why? Because this speaker is sending much less energy over towards the neighboring speaker's coverage area. You'll find that we move our way into isolation. So here's the 10K response, which shows the combing that we saw over the entire screen before confined to a very small percentage of the overall coverage. Out of 180 degrees of coverage, only about 10 degrees of it has got the combing action. The rest of it has got the signs of isolation, a smooth uh, response through there, through the 10 kilohertz region. If we look at the 1 kilohertz response, you'll see that even its combs are less deep. It's a single comb, and there's the phase wheel turning, and then we're heading to isolation. The 100 hertz response looks quite similar. Why? Because the very large wavelength um, is not greatly affected by that splay angle. So there's a taste of what's going on in uh, Chapter 2 summation of the book. I hope you find this interesting and uh, look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Bye-bye.